euh, bah, déjà, on, on se retrouve pour le panel, ce panel numéro 2. Alors, je n'ai pas, de, j'ai pas de, d'introduction préparée comme, comme l'or, donc c'est assez bref, puisque l'intérêt surtout, c'est d'entendre euh, nos panélistes. Euh, le premier panel était vraiment euh, donc, très intéressant. Merci effectivement aux panélistes d'avoir euh, échangé avec nous sur, euh, sur ce sujet. L'intérêt, c'était de comprendre les mécanismes, ce qui sous-tendait juridiquement finalement, ce qui sous-tend juridiquement ce, ce DPF. Et c'était intéressant d'entendre Marc à la fin et expliquer finalement les, je dirais les, euh, le, le processus aussi de, de réflexion aux États-Unis avec le Congrès euh, voilà, qui a mené à cela. Maintenant, l'idée de ce deuxième panel, ou plutôt l'objectif, c'est de comprendre comment en pratique finalement ce DPF euh, fonctionne, euh, vit, s'applique mais quels sont aussi euh, peut-être ses bénéfices, ses inconvénients et comment ça, cela s'inscrit je dirais, peut-être dans un, un, un environnement, euh, un contexte plus général de, de souveraineté française euh, et européenne. Du coup, avec, euh, avec moi à cette table, effectivement, quatre, quatre panélistes que je laisserai effectivement se présenter euh, brièvement. Et euh, je vais commencer avec le, le panéliste à ma, à ma droite, euh, euh, effectivement, il y a Jean Sauce. Je, qui parle anglais, donc je vais l'introduire, en, ou en tout cas le lancer en, en anglais. So, Ilya, thank you to be with us today. Um, as I was saying, now the, the objective of this panel, after hearing what the uh, DPF was about from a legal per, uh, point of view, it's how it works in practice. So you work for a company, commercial company. We heard that it was for, uh, for fostering transfer of data, commercial data between uh, Europe and US. So on your day-to-day basis, what the DPF about, how it works, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I, I want to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to be here with you today. Um, I will apologize uh, for the fact that I have to speak and present to you in English while the slides are on their way to show up. Um, uh, it, uh, I, I am Greek-Belgian, Marik ben Salih, so je suis flamand. So, unfortunately, my, the, the French is non-existent in my case. Uh, I'm pleased to say my sons are doing better in terms of speaking French, but uh, that's not the case for me. So, um, with your indulgence, I will try to present uh, and discuss this very important point in English. If we could go to the next slide, please. So, I am the Chief Privacy Officer of Broadcom, and um, I think... Um, that when I look at how we've uh, been doing with data protection in Europe and how we've been doing with the, with the international data transfers, we need to level set. We need to look whether we agree on the fundamentals. And let me tell you what I think the fundamentals are. Number one, we've been successful in setting the norm, in setting the standard for privacy around the world. As I like to say to my American friends, if I have to choose between GDPR data breach laws and 52 state breach laws in the US, I'll take GDPR any given Sunday. We've been very successful at doing that. GDPR is a tool for industrial policy, is a tool for human rights protection, but it's also very much a regulation about market and how market players manage data, and we should not lose sight of that. And in that regard, um, GDPR is about managing free flow of data in the European Union. First and foremost, it's not about building a wall, if you remember certain politicians in the US about building walls. So it's not about doing that. It's about regulating how we flow data in Europe and internationally. And needless to say that when it comes to digital and cyber, flowing of data, transfer of data is critical to maximize the benefits. The best example I can think of, because the chairman asked me to give practical examples, is cybersecurity. We need to flow data on a 24 by 7 basis so that if we detected an attack in Australia, when people are asleep in Paris, we are able to block that attack in Australia and utilize the knowledge of how that attack looks like to be able to block that same attack when the computers are switched on in Paris. Or even when people are sleeping, 
while you know, the attack is happening. So being able to flow data internationally is absolutely critical. You'll see at the, the last bullet point is that I'm an ex-European Commission official. I am a European. I was born and raised in Europe, and I'm a father of three. So I want Europe to be economically successful. I want us to be doing the right thing, which means that I want us to be also sovereign, and I need us to be geopolitically smart, especially since one of my two countries, if you like, is on the borders of the European South. At the same time, we need digital growth to drive our industries. We need innovation, and we cannot legislate it. We need to grow it internally. And I will also tell you that, frankly, when I, when I look at the bigger picture of where the market is right now, I have a job because of the privacy laws in Europe. But the perspective of, of Broadcom is very different, if you like, from the perspective of, of, of some of the things that you heard earlier, because we're not a consumer-focused company. We're a B2B company. You're using all our products in most of your day-to-day -day life. If you have an espresso machine at your house, the Bluetooth chip that we're supplying tells you whether your coffee, ca your coffee pad is original or not. If you have an iPhone, you have some of our wireless connectivity. If you're using a Sagem modem at your house, you're having Broadcom chips and you don't know it. But still, um, privacy is very important for us, even though we do not access consumer data. And the attitude of B2B companies around privacy is very different from the attitude and the needs of B2C companies. Next slide, please. So, this slide is coming. Where do we stand on international data transfers? Ladies and gentlemen, think of how a world would be without international transfer for a second. Think of how, I, I mean, I, I lived the 1980s, okay, where actually correspondence was done on paper. Uh, I have run Lynx, which is a text-based browser, and Pine, which is a text-based email uh, uh, client using Linux. Think about how it would be if we wouldn't be able to use our credit cards or browse the internet or use the tools that we're using today. So if we're having a discussion around data protection principles, and they're very important, and I agree with them, and we should have it, and we should defend those principles, those that say that there should not be data flows need to answer to the very basic question. OK, what do you propose as an alternative? What is the other option? Because let's face it, if the other option is, let's go back to 1980s, that's fine. But people need to know what it is that they're choosing. We, I, I promised I would say something about the, the data privacy framework. Um, I will tell you very openly that my goal is, among the many other things, that uh, my lord and master, the chief legal officer, tells me, uh, make sure that nothing goes wrong in privacy. But my goal is also to get Broadcom Data Privacy Framework certified. Because I believe that it is one of the important data transfer mechanisms. And I'll explain why. At the heart of GDPR and of the SECs and of the rules around data transfer is the risk-based approach. And we need to be looking at real risk, not theoretical. And I say that because experience shows that, and we heard all the stories as they emerged from the Snowden disclosures, and they're real and they're important, and we need to be mindful of those risks. But at the same time, these are not risks that are applicable to the vast majority of companies and to the vast majority of data that flows around the world. And this is the actual real life experience. Um, I think that overall technology and privacy enhancing technologies have helped us to make the security controls more effective. And that the technological evolution has played a big role. Bring your own key. The development of sovereign cloud. Market and customer pressure. And I'm mentioning there on the slides VMware, why? Because we just spent 61 billion buying a company that enables technologies like sovereign cloud. So we genuinely believe that this is the direction 
of travel and that, we are, or that organizations are able to deliver to some of those capabilities. Um, also, it's very important to mention the organizational controls that companies and, 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 and let's say market operators need to put in place when they're doing data transfers, be that separation of roles, having registries of incidents, policies, contractual terms, and let's not forget the role of the data protection authorities to supervise and enforce. Again, I'm stressing the point based on real life market guidance and based on real life risk. Because if these two things do not exist, eventually market operators look at the guidance or look at the requirements and go, well, nobody can comply on this anyhow, so let's just move on. Next slide, please. So what about the other transfer instruments? So, because there is the data privacy framework, but what about everything else? Standard contractual clauses, they will continue to be extremely important and we will keep having them and we will keep, we as the industry as a whole, relying on them. Because whether you're a big or you're a small company or you're using a mix between data privacy transfers, data privacy framework, BCRs, the SECs will continue to be a cost-effective and flexible instrument. And it's, it's a pity I don't see Mr. Giacarelli in the room because I want to say that the Commission has done a very good job in putting together the different modules, module one to four, on updating the latest version of the SECs. I will tell you very openly as well that switching between the defunct privacy shield and, and, and safe harbor to SECs is an amazingly painful experience that I do not want to relieve. I cannot describe you the mad rush of changing hundreds of suppliers from one type of agreement to the other. Data privacy framework will inevitably be litigated. That's fine. We accept that risk. We hope that it will make it through. But we do rely on SECs in order to have all the basis covers covered. But we do also believe that it's a good mechanism and we will go and apply for that mechanism as also the fact that um, the protections of the data privacy framework extend to the SECs. So whatever has been agreed with the US in that area is not just limited to the data privacy framework around the protections, around the oversight mechanism, extends also to the other instruments and that is very positive. We have a lot of, we, we see a momentum in adequacy decisions. That's very good. It proves the success of the GDPR as a model. Uh, Singapore, Korea, the UK, other jurisdictions that we're considering. Um, all that is positive and all that is the direction of travel that we want to see continued. Binding corporate rules. Um, they're good for certain business models, but they have their limitations. To give you an idea, uh, Broadcom is a very acquisitive company. If, we, if I had to update my BCRs after every acquisition that I'm doing, my BCRs would be constantly outdated. They're a good mechanism for companies that don't necessarily move as fast as we do. Otherwise, cost, slow, and, and doesn't accommodate radical changes. Certifications and codes of conduct, which is the other transfer mechanism, I'm sorry to say, as a community, we have failed. Um, show me a code of conduct or a certification mechanism that is generally acceptable and is considered a good data transfer mechanism. There isn't one. And that's also because of the conflict between, let's say, the jurisdictional conflict that occasionally we see in Europe. Next slide, please. Um, I mentioned that uh, privacy law is often used or is being discussed to be used as an element of industrial policy. I would invite, I, I can see why this is happening, but I would also invite caution. Why? Others are seeing us doing this, they're learning from it and they're getting ideas. And they will be using the same arguments that we're using, but this time they would be using them against us and to disadvantage us. And I'm not suggesting that the United States is doing that. But there are other players around the world which will take advantage of a, the same angle that we're taking. But I would like to bring up also a couple of other points because we talk about competitiveness and innovation and using data. All advanced jurisdictions 
when it, that have privacy law also have exceptions around product improvement. All of them have exceptions around the fact that companies should be able to utilize data to become more competitive. We have legitimate interest as that equivalent provision in GDPR. The problem is we interpret it so narrowly that in practice it's very, very difficult to do that. Think about this, that the Commission had to produce a legislation called Data Act and the Data Governance Act to address the fact that we don't share, we Europeans don't share enough data with each other. So we had to do legislation on top of the existing legislation, silently amending GDPR, to try to fix that problem. I say try because we don't know if it works yet. Um, there is a lot of discussion around trying to limit data transfers on the basis of sovereignty. I think that is going to be a big issue because on one hand, the market is providing a more sovereign options when it comes to public, to public cloud, but at the same time, limiting this has a big impact on competitiveness, has a big impact um, on resulting into complexity because usually it's limited either in a regulatory way or through standards. And in the case of standards, and I'm bringing up UCS as one of the examples of what's been discussed in Brussels, again, we end up in a limbo because the introduction of a, in a technical discussion, a discussion of a standard, of a political consideration like sovereignty results in the parties not being able to agree with each other. And again, we are essentially stuck. While we need the standards, we need the standard like UCS. From an industry, large and small, what we need is, obviously, first of all, ability to innovate with data. Ability to flow data and remain competitive in a manner which is consistent, clear, in terms of the law. We do recognize the need of the public sector for more sovereignty and for more sovereign clouds for, for the specific needs and also security needs that the public sector has. But then the public sector also needs to be prepared to manage the requirements and the cost associated with that and simplicity on the requirements. I listed there all the relevant acts from the last commission plus GDPR that have come to regulate essentially the same infrastructure, ladies and gentlemen. DORA, GDPR, NIS2, Data Act, all of that are stuff that I would be responsible for inside the company. And by the way, I haven't touched DMA, DSA, and Data Governance Act, right? I'm missing even three. Next slide. And I believe the final slide. So, we need effective management of our alliances between democracies because we're going to be operating um, in, a, in a world that becomes excessively fragmented. So our market share in terms of how we can operate and flow data is becoming smaller. So we need to actually work together with our partners to maintain a sizable market for us. Otherwise, we're going to be in a situation whereby to put it simply, the pie will become smaller for everybody. And that means more competition and, frankly, less revenue, less value, less to share. Um, growing local industry to become organically competitive is key. And as I said, that is not something that can be done with regulation. I found it very interesting that, I, that we were before at uh, the Goldberg uh, Hall, which is the, the, the established let's say, um, driver of mercantilism as an economic model. It's, it's, that, was, that was very telling. But at the same, interesting coincidence, but at the same time, when you look at this from a different point of view, you know, we need to subsidize those that need to grow, not those that are not doing well, but just happen to be very, very big. Um, we need to be open, but not be foolish, be reciprocal. We, I stress the point about access to data. We talk about driving artificial intelligence. We cannot drive artificial intelligence without having a suitable data training set. We need common standards, and we need a truly single market. And that's a big issue. Um, I was speaking to a member state representative yesterday, and we were discussing about the policies that they were putting in place on incident response, and the fact that certain markets in Europe were close to them on grounds of language. They didn't want to try to do incident response in English. It had to be on the local language. So 
we should leverage the size of the European market and compromising protection of EU human values and, uh, frankly, effective implementation of the national security requirements that we had a very hot debate previously. We have all the fundamentals we need to be successful. We have the capital, we have the education, we have the skills, we have the talent. We need to get this policy right. Thank you very much and happy to take any questions. Thank you. <clears throat> Maybe, um, thank you, thank you, Elias. Du coup, est-ce que, alors je me tourne vers la salle, est-ce que, est que quelqu'un aurait une question pour, pour nos panélistes, hein, que ce soit du panel 1 ou du panel 2 Merci, David. Oui Je ne sais pas s'il y a un micro. Pour... Oui. Uh, good afternoon. I will uh, give a question in English. My French is not so good, uh, so my apologies. Uh, one observation and one uh, out outlandish suggestion to solve the problem. Uh, my observation is what Elias was saying, all the GDPR so far has helped the companies, not the consumers. If I look at Google, just an example, $90 billion 2016 revenues, $300 billion 2023 revenues, 30% Europe, almost $300 billion delivered from Europe on, on search. So I think uh, the European consumer is not getting the right deal. Now in terms of uh, coming up with a suggestion how about if we treat, because in the AI world, data is the first class citizen, not we. And if data is a first class citizen, how if we start treating data the same way we treat we as nationals? For an example, uh, th there is no way French government would allow a French national to be extradited to US. How about we make the same rules for the data? That there is no way you can extradite my data which uh, to the US government. I know it, it may sound a bit outlandish, but if data is such an important commodity in the world, then why can't the governments think the data to be like the citizens and treat them in the same way? So that's a, a discussion point to the panel. Thank you. You can start. So, a couple of thoughts. Folks, if your issue is the social media business model, do something about it. And I'm saying it in an equally provocative manner. Why? Because if you go to the Broadcom, to www.broadcom.com slash privacy, I'm giving you the URL as well, you will see for the global privacy policy that I'm responsible for, that we are telling you that we're not selling or sharing your personal data. So don't assume that every company that happens to be NASDAQ listed is actually in the business of online behavioral advertising. If as consumers, you feel so strongly about how certain companies are processing your data, I will ask this question, why do you use them? Why don't you use the existing alternatives? So is it because they have a better product? If it is because of that reason, then that should also make us think. I'm saying this because I was listening, you know, the, the speaker that followed me, who focused very much on the social media. And, and look, I have an issue with surveillance capitalism as well, okay? But please understand, not all of us are the same, and many of us certainly don't do this. So if the problem, again, and I'm stressing this, is you mentioned GAFAM, or some of you mentioned GAFAM, or previously was mentioned GAFAM, Fine. Equally, the idea that for some reason the GDPR was designed so as to reduce profits from companies that are doing data business, I find that strange. The GDPR was designed to protect personal data of individuals. And in that, I'm sorry, it has been extremely successful. How many data subject access requests does a social media network receive on a daily, on a monthly basis? How much more transparency has it achieved around the processes of protecting or managing personal data? 
by those companies. How, do you know that there's, we're talking about about 5 billion in fines on GDPR? 5 billion. Show me another piece of European legislation that has delivered 5 billion in fines in five years. I can tell, show you only one in absolute numbers, and it's been running for 50 years. It's competition law. Is there anything else? But India, they, they generated 300 billion dollars. Yes. Last six years. Correct. So 5 billion is what? So, what percent? So, so you're telling me that they're not finding them enough. No. That's, that's a different thing. Sorry. My point is not about fining. There is okay. nothing wrong in having regulations which help citizens. Okay. I think the goal of the regulation is to help citizens. That's the whole point. And one of the key points for EU data is we want to protect the data of individuals. So, so, so sir, the, your view, and that's, this is where we need to be very, very clear about something. Your view is that the EU legislation is there to protect citizens, and you're correct about that. But because my role is different, my view is also that the EU regulation is there to regulate the market. And again, remember what I said from the beginning. When we're talking about regulating the market and setting the framework conditions for the market, the same regulation needs to cater for people that process individual personal data for business gain and for people that don't. GDPR applies the same way to Google, because you mentioned it, to Yahoo, to Facebook, as it applies to me, that I don't touch your marketing data. So this is why, in that sense, you can say it's imperfect, because what we need is a privacy legislation for consumer businesses, if what you want to tackle is that bit. And this is why things like DMA have come to power. But, I mean, in the end, we need to make a decision as a society what it is that we want, and what do I say a decision as a society, what it is that we want? Do we want a model whereby data processing is on one hand, but free services are on the other? Because this is what those companies are offering. Or we want a model whereby it's subscription-based. We make our money by selling you subscription software. Actually, by selling to companies subscription software. I used to work for another company, Symantec, that was selling you Norton for 50 euros a license. And again, I don't want to defend that, okay? But just to be clear of where we are. 